walls. And, um, and I, well, I'll just dive right in. Have you ever had, this will be a two-week series. We're going to finish this next week. We're going to pour some foundation and talk a little bit about it this week. Have you ever been in a home or maybe you live out in a country? You don't have to live in a country right here in Pinellas County sometimes where there's no country. <laughs> you, have, you ever have a, like a bird fly into your house or something come down your chimney maybe and then be caught in the chimney? If you live out in a country, you have all sorts of critters coming in and out of your house all the time. Around here, the critters are limited except for people and, um, and stuff like that. But in, what happens with that bird that flies into your house? What does it normally do? You, you talk to it. Hi, little birdie. You can trust me. I'm your friend. Have a seed. And, um, and it's land on my finger, and I'll walk you outside, and you can live your happily life, and we'll flow around trees and eat worms in my yard. You can do all that stuff. Just please get out of my house, and I'll, I'll, I'll help you. That bird doesn't listen to you. And it's not because he doesn't understand English. He, 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 is, um, he is afraid, and he reacts, and he fly, starts flying around the house. And what happens when he starts flying around the house? Smashes in the walls. He just, whatever he does, he fly, he'll just find the closest, hopefully a window. And because you'll see, oh, a window. <laughs> and he'll keep doing that and doing that till you either catch him or he knocks himself unconscious or he dies. I was at my old office on US 19 numerous years ago, back 2005, six, somewhere in there. And I had the, my offices on the, um, facing the windows, a lot of windows facing the, the west. And I'll, I'm in there and all of a sudden I hear a bang. I look out, and there's a, a pigeon lying on, the, lying on the concrete like this. Sunbathing. sunbathing. He was sunbathing. I thought he might have been sleeping, but he wasn't. He was deceased. And he didn't see my window. He ran into a wall. That's what we do as believers sometimes, my friends. You, you have walls in your life. I have them too. And they come from a bunch of different ways. I'm not going to really get to where they come from. I'm going to talk about, w- define, help define what some of them are and how do we get victory over them. And, where, and, and how did we find, even discern them in the first place. But let's just take a look at some of the common scenarios. One man's personal sexual gratification could and often creates a lifelong wall in an innocent child. One man's lust that he can't control, and maybe that lust or that, that desire for this perverted sexual gratification comes from a wall in his own life and something that happened to him as a young man. Likely it does, something that never made its way to the freedom. He afflicts, because of this sickness that he has, he afflicts his will upon a small child that will forever impact and create a wall in that small child's life. Trust me, it never goes away until it's, re- until it's addressed. Another father who never deals with his anger, I'm not picking on dads, this goes to moms too, deals with his anger issues, possibly because he grew up in anger issues, creates a home full of walls. Run that video again. <laughs> <laughs> creates a home full of walls that without intervention will replicate those walls um, in their children's homes. So he has an angry dad. He creates, and because of his anger, he intimidates those people around him. He intimidates his wife. He intimidates his children because he's got a loud mouth. He's boisterous, and he's the toughest one in the house. So either, the, and sometimes that, that intimidation will come even the physical beyond emotional creating a wall in these children's homes and, and potentially his wife's home. The other side of the coin, maybe it's a mother that smothers their children and they make their children their idol and make their children their gods. And so they emotionally manipulate their children so they never have to let go. They never have to let their kids grow up and be accountable. So they leave in their children's great walls of irresponsibility maybe. Great walls of fear because they need mother's help to cope. Great insecurity because they've never been able to deal with life. Maladjusted adult children. There's a wall in their life. A man leaves his children, abandons his children, and abandons their mother. Then has sporadic at best or no investment in these children's lives. These children have walls of rejection growing up. 
You can see behavioral things beginning in the children's lives. And you'll, as they grow older, you'll find that these walls just grow stronger. It's like the video, go higher and higher and stronger and stronger until they're addressed, if they're addressed. I venture to say most don't get addressed. I venture to say most of us learn how to live with this damage in our soul and never address and resolve and bring healing to the power of God. There are millions of Christians caught in an internal prison, millions of people caught in an internal prison where they don't even know how to begin to get out. And as a Christian, all these walls like Jericho come tumbling down just like that, huh? No, they don't. We carry them into our Christian faith. But we don't have to pay, we don't have to pay homage to them anymore. We have a solution. We have a life and a power inside of us that few believers embrace. The truth, sad truth, is Christians have great walls in their souls. Some are realized. Some aren't realized. Some are ignored, and some are even defended. They're walls. The, now, the, the Christian walk, our life, indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, in the momentum of our spiritual transformation, I'm choosing my words carefully, in the momentum of our spiritual transformation, is either accelerated or slowed down by God's ability to reveal to us and help us overcome spiritual walls that we built in our soul. Now, I'll go back and readdress that point in a moment because I have something important to say about that. First, let me read these verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5, through 5, New Living Translation. I'm going to bring this up in the um, King James here so I can read that to you too. We are, we are human, but we don't, war, we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So it says we don't wage war as humans do, like the rest of the world, because we, we, in a, one sense, the church is an inhuman race. We're indwelt by the power of God. So we don't approach walls uh, like a human do. We don't approach our problems, our past, like humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, because they can't af affect this. God's mighty weapons to knock down strongholds. That word stronghold talks about a rock fort. To knock down strongholds or walls of human reasoning. Now, the word human reasoning there in, in, in false arguments is a, is a Greek word. It's hupsoma in the Greek, and there's a lot of different ways to look at this word, but I want to take it into what I know is at least a biblical and a practical application. It talks about high things. In the King James, it says high things, every high thing. Well, hupsoma means the high things of what? The world system. The world system that we understand in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is the president of. The cosmic world system. He's the president. He's the organizer. He's the manipulator. He's the um, implementor of, and his cohorts, the demons, of, of the evil world system. Inside this evil world system, you find carnage and, and destruction and abuse and, 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 and murder and all the things that we see on planet Earth. So remember that cosmos. And remember the word sin, which is our old nature that lives in which lives in this world system that becomes polluted because it has no other option. It doesn't know any better. Before I know Christ, I can't combat the world. I will be infected by the world. Now, if you've lived longer, maybe you're young and you don't realize this, but you've lived as long as I have, like 35 years or something like that, if you live that long, you'd look back and you'd say, wow, that the values I had as a, as a young person and the values in the same group age group today are so incredibly different. And every generation thinks they're the last one because the young generation can't survive. 
And it's true. What changed? Did people change? No. The world changed. This world system changed, and this world system has a way of infecting, influencing, and manipulating the human race. That's why Christians, we need to be so aware of what's inside this iPad. <laughs> and the 50 translations I have inside this iPad. We need to be so aware of that because we, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So before I get any further into this, what are some of the, um, hey, let me define wall for you first of all. I'm sorry, this is important. I define this word wall. Remember this, scribble it down. Um, we will have this um, next week we'll be talking about this same subject again. A wall is a place of wound, weakness, or resistance that hinders and mutes our spiritual transformation. A wall is a place of wound, weakness, or resistance that hinders and mutes our spiritual transformation. Now, what are some of the primary um, ways, reasons people are not able to break down these walls that they have in their lives. Not talking about the non-church, I'm talking about God's people, you and I, Christians. Number one reason is, is it really pretty, sort of easy to understand and it's pretty obvious. They don't want to. They like their walls, they don't plan on giving them up. They don't, spiritual transformation is not necessarily their agenda. I'm going to say more soon about that. So, they, they just, I remember Ray Woods, I said this in the first service years ago, he did a, he was in the first service, he did a, um, a spoke somewhere, I think he was doing, taking an offering in our pulpit, and he, and he says, hey, don't mess with my blind spots. <laughs> and, and I never forgot that, because it's true, don't mess with my blind spots. As long as you don't mess with my blind spots, or God doesn't mess with my blind spots, I can remain blind. And remaining blind is comfortable for me, I've learned how to live in my blindness. Which brings me sort of to my next point. I, I don't care to remove my walls. Or number two, um, if, if, and this is important not to ask yourself this question. If, if being more like Jesus, Christ-likeness, spiritual transformation, being conformed into his image, being more like Jesus is not the goal and the focus of your life, then play with your iPhone. Or your iPad, the rest of the service says, I have nothing else to offer to you. But if being like Jesus is the focus of your life, if you want to be transformed from the inner out, if you want to reflect Christ to a world, if you want to reflect Christ to your family, if you want His nature to become your, your nature, if you want His personality to become your personality, if you want Him to go on the inside of you and make you more like Him, then stay tuned. Because we have to be, we at some point, my friend, I have to say, that's what I want. That's my goal. How do I get there? How do I let Christ make me more like Him? How do I let Him transform me? We all have stuff. 30 years in the ministry, I can guarantee you have stuff. Thank God I don't. <laughs> See, some of us have never been confronted with them, and I hope today, if you've been living with walls and we happen to knock on your door, I hope that you'll have the humility and the meekness and the courage, the courage to confront these walls in your own life because it's, um, it'll take courage. You don't have to confess them to other people yet, <laughs> but just acknowledge them yourself. So the first wall that I want to get to, and we'll have a three or four more next week, is the wall of determined denial. What's the wall of determined denial? I don't have a problem. You have a problem. I don't have a problem. I'm good. Y you have the problem. That's, that's the wall of determined denial. And, and this manifests numerous different ways. Years ago, as a, as a principal of a Christian school, as many of you know, we had plenty of kids. Some of the kids are here today as adults with a bunch of kids themselves. And, um, and, and we would always, my wife and I would talk to the kids and we'd give them whatever we were saying. And their common response by many would be, I know, I know. I know, I know. It was like so quick, I know, I know. What you're saying is that if you knew you knew, you would do, do, do. 
<laughs> but you don't know because you don't do. And I only know what I do, right? I only know, I can only say I know something, biblically speaking, epinosis. I only know what I can put in practice in my life. I can say I believe that, but that has no influence and no authority in my life. Do I really, has it really impacted me? Has it brought me under its submission? No, it hasn't. So that's one of, that's part of determined denial. We, we quickly dismiss and refuse to see oftentimes these blind spots even though they're directly addressed. Who here um, sees blind spots in other people? A few of you. Who married a blind spot? <laughs> well, you all married blind spots. That's great. That's great. You, you, you know what? You probably did to some, to some, to some point. Well, if, if you think that somehow you look at other people, that guy has a blind spot, boy. Boy, that girl, whoa, wow. Thank God I'm not married to them. <laughs> and, and, and they have a blind spot, something like that. You probably, you, and, but you don't see your own blind spots? Of course you don't because they wouldn't be blind spots. They'd be issues then. <laughs> then you've deceived yourself. We all must confront these things. Sometimes in a big battle, and sometimes in a bunch of little battles throughout the course of our life. Sometimes people are just more comfortable, comfortable, as well as miserable, without dealing with the things that God puts front and center in their life. Steve Audubon calls it um, the it. The it. What is the it? The it is what it is that determines my problem. I am this way because of it. I am this way because of the it of my childhood. I am this way because of the it of my, that person I married. I am this way because of the it of the balance of my checkbook. I am this way because of the it of the U.S. government. <laughs> I am, it's, some, it's something, there's an it out there. Now, sometimes we have numerous its, but many times we have one predominant it, and we use that it as our excuse, as our um, get-out-of-jail-free card to never really resolve issues in our heart. God is really bad about showing me other people's problems. I wish he was better at that. When I go to prayer in the morning and I start praying for other people that God would just fix them, he never shows me what, he never does it. He never answers those prayers. Now, I pray that he blesses them. I think he answers that. But God, fix that person. Because if you fix that person, I, my life would be better. And then God sort of taps me on the shoulder and said, Tim, I'm working on them, and hopefully they're seeking them. But I don't really want to talk to you about them. Because you have your own stuff that I'm trying to address in your life. And in your case, it's probably just called pride. <laughs> Maybe other stuff too. So, so what is my it? Maybe I had an abusive father. And that abuse at some level has spilled into my life today. I'm trying to show you how these things happen. Either, uh, either by a level of harshness or a lack of empathy or outright abuse. Now, you may be able to say, well, I had my followers that way. Okay, I, I, I agree with that. But what are you going to do with it? You're going to follow his depraved footsteps? You're going to submit to his walls that created walls in your own life? You're going to adopt his blind spots or issues that he refuses to address and to get help with and to let the Holy Spirit transform? And just follow in his footsteps? Well, good question. Obviously, the answer to that is, I hope not. <laughs> if you are thinking about people you know with this problem, you have just run smack into a wall. <laughs> this is not about anyone. I was going to pass out mirrors at the door. <laughs> but this is about you. And this is about me. I just get the privilege of telling you about it. <laughs> if we have our opinion and we defend it, if we take our wall and we defend it, not even open to the fact that we might be wrong, 
and there's a better way, I most likely have the wall of determined denial. Now, get me wrong. Sometimes we understand where my stuff comes from, but we don't ever resolve it. We don't ever let spiritual transformation take place in our lives. That, my friends, is unnecessary. That is sin because there's another option that we have. Let me ask you some questions here. I have six questions that will help you diagnose if you have this um, wall of determined denial. First of all, do you ever admit that you were wrong? You've met people, and I've met people that never can be wrong. But they're wrong. More times than they'd ever like to admit. And have you ever been to a conflict with somebody? And you know they were wrong, but, you, but God got hold of you and you went to them and you made things right, even though you really weren't wrong, but you didn't want a peace between brothers. And then instead of embracing and, and saying, I'm sorry too, or what, however that manifests, you say, well, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you finally came around to your senses. I couldn't believe you said that to me in the first place. I can't believe that. that, that, that. You might, you do have a wall. And it's a big one. <laughs> so, you admit you're wrong. Number two, will you ever ask for forgiveness? <laughs> if the answer to that is no, then you got a big wall. Do you ever ask for somebody else's opinion? You say, well, I would pass it, but it's not necessary. I know everything. <laughs> what, and however that goes, hey, I want, what's your opinion? What do you think about this? One of the keys in leadership in, in church level, any level really, is getting other people's opinions and getting people's thoughts. In the last 30 years of, of being part of a church, I, I realized I don't know everything. And people have different gift sets that I don't have. I want to glean from their gift sets. Are you ever willing to ask for help? I don't need help. If I ask for help, they won't do it right. Determined denial. The wall. How about this one? This is a biggie. Well, that's just the way I am. I'm just this way. This is me. And I would agree with you. That is you. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't mean that you can't be somebody else. It doesn't mean that you have to stay being you. It doesn't mean that personality that you defend and that insecurity that you build fortresses around can't be resolved. Do I always have to be right and have to get in the last word? Am I one of those guys that I just have to be right and, and I'm going to get the last word and even if I have to talk over you, even if I have to yell over you, even if I have to just keep talking to you, you're so tired by my voice, I finally say, oh yeah, you're right. Just end this conversation because I'm tired. Now, I was a young, when I was, grew up in a home, and many of you know my story, it's, it's pretty boring. It's just I grew up in a normal New England home, and, you know, I was born in, you know, 1970-something, I don't know, something like that. And um, <laughs> I forget, really, I'm not, making, I'm not making an issue out of that at all. And, and um, no, I was born, and, and, and I had my parents, my mom and dad were there throughout my life. I've lost them both, and... My dad was a hard, hard worker, and he supplied up for our family. My mom was a great homemaker. And, and, um, but, you know, in my childhood, which I left home when I was 19 and a half to go to Bible college, and I got saved when I was 19, a uh, year, but a little bit before that. And um, my childhood, I ne the word L-O-V-E, love, I don't ever remember hearing the word love one time. I don't remember being encouraged by my parents in a sense. I'm not cracking on my parents. I love my parents, and I'm very close to my dad, especially my mom passed away when I was uh, 20, 21, so I, didn't get, I was just getting to be an adult and so when we lost mom. But I, I remember my parents, I, went, I played four years of high school football and baseball, and they never attended one game. Went to Little League and Babe Ruth ball, never attended one game. I, I remember my high school graduation. I drove myself there, graduated, come home. They never attended my graduation, anything like that. No, I didn't think much about it. I didn't think at that time I'm being neglected or unencouraged or unloved. I didn't think much about it. I just grew up in a very unemotional, unphysically and verbally and emotionally unaffectionate environment. 
So I find myself, as, as a Christian now, married and with children, and I find myself sort of like the same way. My dad was a yeller. He'd just yell. He just wasn't mean or abusive, but everything, to get his point across, he'd, oh, he'd just yell. So we'd listen, because we probably wouldn't listen otherwise. So I found myself as a, as a, young, as a young man, a young dad, a young, young husband, being to have a loud voice and just sort of yelling, just sort of replicating my dad. And I, I, I realized to be vulnerable with somebody and, and speak and expose myself and my feelings and my true things to somebody was, was difficult for me to do. The Kelly bloodline has, a, has a, by birth, a doctrinal degree in self-consciousness. <laughs> so for me to get up in front of people and communicate and have people look at me and talk for a living, wow, that's a miracle. <laughs> so here I am. Now I'm an adult and I own a Bible. I'm indwelt with the Holy Spirit. I can either acknowledge that these are strongholds in my life I want to overcome or I can submit to them and just follow my natural course of my life. Now, obviously, I chose for God to transform me. The word love and affection comes out of our mouth every day in my home, and there is hugs and tackles and everything that goes on every day in my home, and, and I have no issues expressing that. I tell people here all the time. I love them. People get mad at me because I hug them. Pastor, you're like sweaty. It's like disgusting. Don't hug me anymore. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. Take you your shower when you go home. <laughs> and I'm anything like that. Listen, we only get one chance in life. Just one. We know that to be true, don't we? It isn't worth it to hang on to our stuff. It isn't worth it to have stuff between family and stuff between, between other Christians. It's just not worth it. You only get one shot. There's three men there are discussing their funerals. One man said, when, when the mourners look down at me in my coffin, I want them to say I was a good man. The second man says, when I, when I want them to look down at me in my casket and say I was a good father. The third man says, I want them to look down at my casket and say, hey, he's moving. He's alive. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I would like to have them set, talk, say that about me, but not necessarily physically moving. He's moving. He was a real person. He could be transparent. He could be vulnerable. He could be honest. It didn't care about the feedback. Let me move on to the next point, and this is another. This is a little bit of a controversial point. I hope you agree with me on this. If not, um, you can send me an email in 2014, and I'll and I'll and I'll read it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Number three: walls often, not always, will stem from a generational curse. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about generational curses. This is a little bit of a controversial subject in Christendom because I think a lot of people will look at that and they'll read some of the verses I'm about to read here for you and they will um, they'll look at a generational curse and think it's somehow there's this mystical thing out there that just all of a sudden you're going to look at here's the dad and here's the son and the grandson and the next and great grandson and God's just going to go and just curse them. Sounds like God, huh? And, um, and that, but that's how we see a generational curse. I don't think it's that complex. I, don't think, I think it's actually a pretty easy thing to understand. Let me frame out the verses I'm about to uh, talk to you. In Exodus 33, you know, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai. They're having the orgy with the golden calf. He gets mad. God gets mad. He takes the Ten Commandments, throws them, uh, and smashes everything. And, and, um, and then he starts pleading on behalf of the nation of Israel. God, if you go with us, I'll lead them, but I don't want to go unless you go with us. God, if you destroy them, all the other nations uh, will, will, won't think that you're able to take your people. We'll be mocked amongst other nations. And, and then God agrees, okay, Moses, I, I, I'll spare them based upon your me, uh, mediation. Then Moses gets a little greedy, and I love it. He pres says this, but God, now that I have you on my side, again, show me your glory. I want to see your glory. He goes, he took a little bite more than he, he was just looking to survival. 
now that he knew he was going to make it, God, can I just see who you are? Can I see your glory? Can I have a personal touch with you? So God says, okay, I'll do that. But if you look on me, you'll die. But when I pass by, I'll, I'll put your head in the cleft of a rock and, and you'll, you'll survive. So he goes up on the mountain, and that's where we pick up the story. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. So what's God doing now? He's saying, this is my glory. Show me your glory. Okay, Moses, I'll show you my glory. This is my glory. I'm about to describe myself. This is God describing himself. This is God telling us what he's like and who he really is. Not what man has made him, not what religion has made him, and not what tradition has made him. This God says, I want you to know who I am. So he says this, And the Lord descended from the cloud with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. I want you to know that's who I am. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Notice there's a comma there. It means he's not done talking. There's more coming. I would have liked to have a period there <laughs> and have the book sort of end there, potentially. But there's a, there's a comma there. This means there's more coming. Visiting the iniquity, I'm sorry, that will no means clear the guilty. That's not good because I'm guilty. <laughs> Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. Well, what do I do with those verses? Well, it says, and there will be no means clear the guilty. And he wasn't. God wouldn't clear those that are, are sinful. God never, never looked at man's sin and said, ah, it's okay. I'll let you slide this time. Every sin ever committed in the human race had to be punished and had to be judged harshly by God. And he did that. So he didn't clear the guilty until that. The cross. See, the cross, those that the verse 35, 4, 5 and verse 6 and half of 30, uh, verse 34, 7 are still in play. God is still all those things. Merciful, kindness, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, but the judging and not having, mer- not having to punish the guilty, Jesus did that. So those other things could be the reality in our life. Jesus punished the guilty. He was the guilty. He took our sins, New Testament, he took our sins, Old Testament of the saints, he forbore those sins until the cross and paid for all sins of mankind from every generation on the cross. So he says, now I say that, okay, so he clears, he clears the guilty. Jesus clears the guilty. But th- does that mean the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the fourth generation? Well, he's still going to zap our kids. No. That doesn't happen to the New Testament saint. Not like that anyway. See, I believe this. And you may disagree with me on this, and, 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 and it's a viable debate. But I believe a, a um, generational curse is found in the human DNA. In other words, I'm created by God. He made, me, he made me a human being. And your DNA and my DNA are very different, isn't it? If all our DNA was the same, we'd just be clones. We'd be lemmings. But they're not. There's no two people's DNA that are exactly the same, not even close in many cases. And inside that DNA is strengths and weaknesses, personality and stronghold. All that stuff is inside the DNA. Now, I had a father and mother, and, and, and they had their DNA that they got from their father and mother. And, and now I have my father and my mom's DNA put inside Tim Kelly and my own br- version of that. So I have my dad's DNA in me, huh? And it's a natural DNA. So if my father had an issue with, let's say, alcoholism or addiction of any type and I have some of his DNA in me might I have a tendency to go in that same direction if my father and his DNA was insecure 
self-conscious, depressed, or my mother? Wouldn't I, at least in my life now, as being their offspring and having their DNA in me, wouldn't I have that same tendency to have those same qualities where, um, where, where the DNA of my parents came from? I think we absolutely would. In fact, you could take on whatever that is, whether it's depression and anger, abuse. Is it, is it some mystical thing that comes down from the atmosphere, or is it something that's just part of our makeup based upon our, our genetics, our DNA? Still talk about an addiction. One of the raging debates in even Christian circles is that there's no real addiction, that, or, or some say there's a, there's a gene inside it. Well, in a sense, that's true, but I just call it DNA. There's, there's in the blood. It's something that is, that is um, in me that came, was passed down from my parents. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to be an alcoholic. It, uh, I may go, I, I, I may not be. I may not even have that big of an issue with it, or I am, may end up having a big issue with it. And some kids seem to skip a DNA, don't they? Some kids, ah, oh, none of my parents are like that. We have, a, we have an interesting um, a, a fellow I know in Swansea, Mass. He's a, he's a black man. African American man, and um, and he his parents are white. Because two generations ago, he had a black man in his family, and that seed was in him. And so when he was born, he was actually born as a black man to white parents. And there was no hanky panky, <laughs> if you know what hanky panky is. <laughs> and um, there's nothing like that. And I remember meeting with him. That's amazing. Your parents are white. Yeah, show me pictures. They're white. You're not. <laughs> And, um, but he was very, very, dis- but because he had, I think it was a grandparent, a great grandparent that had that gene, that, that DNA that was, had an African American gene in them, and all of a sudden, they, when they were born, they were born, they were born black to white parents. Now, that's a little confusing. That's probably caused a little family stress right off the bat, but, 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 they, but they were able, but they were able to, they were able to figure that out after time. So, so. We have, so we thus now we know that we have this human DNA, and from this DNA, um, the stuff that makes me who I am, uh, and now, now, now let me just stop here for a moment, along with the world system, we already talked about that, the cosmic world system that influences from every direction, along with our environment that we grew up in, along with all the society we grew up with, all that stuff that makes up our life that is different for everybody, creates these walls. Or the tendency towards these walls. Let me give you some incredible news here. Hebrews 2.11. I only got about seven minutes left, a little less. So now Jesus and the ones who makes, he makes holy had the same Father. See what that just said? So Jesus, so now Jesus, who makes in the ones he makes holy. Who's the ones he makes holy? That's you and I. That's how come we can be without, without retribution. That's how come we can, we can um, be, we're, guilt, we're, we're guilty. We're, not, we're cleared from being guilty. We've been made holy. We're made as holy as he is because that's the only one that can come into his presence in heaven. They have the same father. I have the same father. Now, wait a minute. I have a father. Me and my brother, we look alike. I have more hair. But, but, but he, had, we, we, <laughs> he might be listening. And we, um, we, we, and, um, and, but we have, and you look at us, and we're very similar. My son, people look at my son and me all the time. He has more hair than me, too, but he's losing it. And will be like me soon. <laughs> and, 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 but if you look at us, and, and the kids will come down and hug me thinking they're him. Because we have the same DNA, same connection there. I'm his father. So he makes us holy, have the same father. So I have the same father. Jesus made me holy, but I have the same father as he has. Wow. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call him his brothers and sisters. Greek word, eldelphos, it means from the same womb. I'm from the same womb, spiritually speaking, as Jesus Christ is. Let me go on. Let me, let me continue. 1 John 3, 9. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. God's life. So they, so they can't keep on, on sinning because they are the children of God. That word God's life is that Greek word sperma. How did my father's DNA start with me? I won't answer that. 
Just look at the Greek word. Sperma, God's seed. So he says, I have God's life. God's seed is in me. His life is in me. His life. So yes, I have a spiritual, I'm, I'm sorry, I have a, a physical, natural DNA. I was born with that. But now in John 3.3, 3, I'm born what? Again. I have a new birth, a spiritual birth, and that spiritual birth means I have a new DNA inside of me also. I not only have a physical DNA, but now I have a spiritual DNA, and my Father is the Father in heaven. So let me go on. i got a little more to say. 1 John 5, 4. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. So what I want to focus on is we're born of God. I was born of my mom and dad, and, um, and I had their DNA in me. But now I'm born of God, and I have a new DNA in me, a spiritual DNA in me. And my friends, this is where you're going to find the ultimate freedom from the walls and generational curses. It's really, if I can encapsulate it, it's the gospel understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ, understanding the ramifications of the gospel of Jesus Christ, understanding what Jesus did, understanding the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how that wants to transform you from the inside out, and then understanding its application in your life. You want freedom from generational curses? You want freedom from walls in your life? Park, park right in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Park right under the shadow of that cross and think about what that cross means and dwell upon what that cross means and meditate upon what that cross means. Think of what it means to be new, a new creature when old things, old DNA, and the effects of old DNA have passed away. Remember last week near the end of the service we quoted Romans 5.20? With sin abound, sin, old DNA. Old DNA, sin. Old DNA. Where sin abounds, grace is what? Super abundantly above and beyond abound. Amplified Bible. So where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. Where my old DNA abound, now I'm born again. And sin now abound. My, this new life abounds over my old life of sin. It's not a balance. They don't balance each other out. My new life has supreme authority in my heart. My new life can look at my old life and say, I'm transforming you, and you can't stop me. I can make this man, or I can make this woman like Jesus, and there's nothing that can stop me, because the authority that's in me, in my new DNA, my spiritual DNA, far, much more abounds over the authority of my sin, my old DNA. So there's no wall, there's no curse, there's no generational anything, my friends. There's no personality thing or something that happened in your childhood or didn't happen in your childhood. It can stop you from being transformed and be like a woman or a man of God from the inside out. This transformation starts the moment I'm born again and can go on through the rest of your life. So don't be subject to these walls and this stuff that hinders you and the insecurities and the fears and all that stuff. Dive into what, everything that God says about you. Pray. Search Him. Seek Him. Knock on His door. Meditate on His Word. Hide it deep in your heart because it's living in Hebrews 4.12. And then you'll find that some of this, this seed inside of you, you won't be the same man anymore, the same woman anymore. Will you still be tempted? Yeah. Will you fall sometimes? Uh-huh. We get up. Because grace is much more abounds. I get up, and I go on, and I start over again, okay. And, and I dive right back in again. I get up, dust off, and you're going to get up 50 times the first month, and you're going to get up um, 49 times the next month, and the next month you're going to get up 48 times the next month, and the next month you're going to get up 36 times. Then 22 times. Then 16 times. And then four or five years later, you don't have to get up. Don't get too prideful because there's more stuff you're still mess, you're messed up with. <laughs> but, but, it's, um, but that battle, that battle's over. You've beat that battle. I'm not the same man I was 30 years ago. I don't even remember him. Don't get me wrong. I got ways to go. God took care of the outward stuff quick. The inward stuff's going hard. <laughs> so my spiritual DNA is far greater than my old DNA. 
That's how we overcome. It's nothing complex. It's what we've been preaching since I've been back from the sabbatical about the naked gospel series. That's our answer. There was no mystical thing. There was no special zap from God. That, I mean, it, was just, it was just, that was God's answer for everything our old DNA could bring into our lives. That was God's answer for everything the world could do, what evil people could do, what bad people could do, what um, indifferent people could do to our life. That was the answer. That's the answer. That's where I find health. That's where I find freedom. That's when I become a real person and I can actually be healed from these insecurities and these fears and these things. I, I put walk, rock fortresses around so I don't have to deal with them. Be vulnerable. Be humble. Confess it to yourself. If you have to confess it to somebody else, go to the cross, receive forgiveness, and get on the road to spiritual health. There, Jesus, thank you.